The first reading this morning is from Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children of the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will acquit anyone who misuses God's holy name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. And from the New Testament, Matthew. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The word of the Lord. Last week we started a sermon series that looked at the Ten Commandments through the lens of Jesus' words in Matthew 22. We learned how these commandments were given as part of God's covenant to the ancient Israelite people. And through this covenant, God was drawing the people into relational love with God and guiding them in the kind of life that God wanted them to live. Today we are going to look more closely at what is sometimes called the first tablet of the Ten Commandments, those commandments that especially talk about our relationship with God. There is a fundamental question that every one of us must settle within life, and that is who or what is most important in our life and has our highest allegiance? That is, who or what is our God? The original people to whom these words were spoken were just months out of Egypt. And ancient Egypt had a multitude of gods, which archaeologists have found depicted in many places. So in inviting the Israelite people into a covenantal relationship, God is making very clear through Moses that there were to be no other gods beside God's self. Being God's people required that they have only one God to whom they are loyal and whom they worship and serve. That requirement remains the same for us today who are Christians and call ourselves God's people. Jesus reaffirmed Deuteronomy 6.5 when he taught that the first and greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart all of our soul, and all of our mind. Now, we may feel that's a fairly easy thing to do within our country, 
But in our society, there are actually many potential gods that may compete with God for loyalty and devotion. There's the God of materialism. We worship this God when our foremost goals in life involve earning enough money and acquiring enough possessions to gain a sense of comfort and security and to feel good about ourselves. When this is our utmost priority within our lives, it becomes a driving force that we serve with all of our energy and time so that other things become less important. There are some who make themselves their god, following what we could say the god of narcissism. This seems to be actually pretty rewarded within our society. It involves considering ourselves to be more important than anybody else, promoting ourselves and using others for our purposes. Sometimes this is accompanied with um, making the acquisition of power one's God or one's highest goal in life. Or our God may simply be to live a comfortable life that's focused on our own selves, um, irrespective of how other people are doing. Even innocent activities like, or things like our home or even like sports um, can become our de facto gods when they become more important to us than anything else. At least that's what the late Billy Graham has said. Various substances and activities that we gain pleasure from and become addicted to can become like gods to us in that they consume our thoughts and our energies and we eventually are willing to sacrifice other things, our closest relationships to them and our devotion to them. Now I know that addiction is a very complex um, disorder and difficulty but there is something of who we worship in the midst of that. Or we can make certain people whom we love our gods such that pleasing them becomes our highest goal irrespective of what we feel God may be actually calling us to do. And there are many gods in our society that call to us for loyalty. Perhaps our work environment is governed by the god of raw capitalism when profit is the only and overriding concern for those that run businesses, such that the welfare of workers and people and society and the earth itself are comparatively unimportant, the pursuit of capitalism has become idolatry. There's the god of nationalism in which love of country is lifted up as one's greatest love and often mixed with religion. This often goes with the god of militarism, which embraces the use of violence to diminish and destroy others to benefit our own nation. No matter what our political party is, we can make a particular ruler our god, looking to them to save us and to bring us prosperity or well-being that we hope for and being willing to grant them a great lot of power to do this. We see this in many places around the world. We have no lack of gods calling for our loyalty today within our society. So the words of this text address us with God's requirement. You shall have no other gods before me. God alone is to have our ultimate loyalty and allegiance. Making anything else more important in serving it with our lives is what scripture refers to here as bowing down to idols. These words come to us, I think, maybe less as demand and more as invitation. Invitation to be a part of the people that in Exodus 19 is referred to as a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Later, Peter uses those same words in 1 Peter 2.9 to refer to Christians. Becoming part of God's people begins with feeling our need for God and God's help, but experiencing God's deliverance and salvation, just as the ancient Israelites did when they were rescued from enslavement and oppression in Egypt. 
It begins with the experience of grace, God's wondrous love for us that's totally undeserved, but is poured out upon us. But it doesn't end there. Begun in grace, a covenantal relationship with God requires that we love and be loyal to God. It's kind of like the covenantal relationship of marriage. Often as a couple is moving toward marriage, there is this experience of wonder at being loved and accepted and chosen simply for who one is. An experience not unlike that of grace. I know that was my experience as I was in courtship with Terry. But marriage is entered into on the basis of promise, of covenant, and is sustained by love and loyalty and a forsaking of all others. God is described here as a jealous God, meaning that God values and is protective of our relationship with God. While letting us experience the consequences of disloyalty and following our own ways in serving lesser gods, consequences that can affect our children and our grandchildren, yet God's character overall is one that is of overflowing steadfast love that goes on and on and on, it says here, for a thousand generations. These Ten Commandments move on to indicate that loyalty and love for this kind of a God shows itself in how we live. It shows itself in how we speak about God. It shows itself in how we take time for God, and it shows itself in how we treat others. The command in verse 7 reads, You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. So we might think together, how do we misuse God's name? You may have been taught that this refers especially to not using God's name in swearing. I was looking on the you know, internet for pictures, and there were pictures of people with their mouth taped closed <laughs> for this particular commandment. <laughs> And it was true that when we love and respect someone, you know, our family members, we don't use their name as part of an expression of disgust or anger or shock. But it's more than that. Misusing God's name can also entail attaching it to what is not worthy of God as a way of rationalizing it or blessing it or even perhaps manipulating others. It's invoking God's name as a mean to achieve perhaps some other end, like economic benefit or perhaps gaining political points. I think this happens too much in our politics. Divisive and denigrating things can be said about other people and policies promoted that are not aligning with God's values in their being unjust, perhaps, or violent. But then, added at the ends of most political speeches are the words, God bless America. The reality is God does not approve of everything politicians speak about. And to suggest so misuses God's name. The ancient Israelite people were so in awe of God that they didn't even dare to say the name that God had revealed to Moses. They substituted the word Adonai, which we translate Lord. They spoke of God with deep reverence. When we also love God with all of ourselves, we speak God's name, we attribute God's name with care and with respect and with love. As I was thinking about this, Gary Chapman's writings on the five love languages came to mind. Some of you have read some of his books. He writes about there's many ways of expressing love, and some of us have favorite ways um, of doing that. But this passage seems to lift up two of these in regard to our love for God. One is to use words of love when speaking of God, and the other is to spend time 
with God. And that leads us into yet another commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Holy here means set apart, special, dedicated to God. It says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. It's a Sabbath to God, but its primary characteristic is that we get a break from our regular work. If we work all the time, and engage all the demands of our life with no regular break. God is simply squeezed out of our lives. Our busyness allows no space for the presence of God. This passage says that we are to follow a regular weekly practice of rest from our work, following the pattern that God set up in the creation of the world in resting on the seventh day and enjoying what is and savoring its goodness. This commandment is both gift and guidance. It is a gift to have God command us to take a break and not think we have to work all the time. It is a gift to feel free to set aside a whole day every week for rest when we can focus on God and worship, when we can reflect on our lives and God's presence within it and realign our priorities, when we can recognize and be okay with our own limitations and relax in God's grace and care. This is God's guidance in how to live a balanced life, attentive to God's presence, a life that is God-oriented, and in which there are no other gods. This is how each week we express our love and our loyalty to God. We put away our regular busy activities to open up space for God and for other people that we love. And we take that day to relish God's grace and God's love for us. The Sabbath command is not only, though, about giving ourselves a break to rest. It also directs all those with power to give others a break as well, so that one's children and employees and work animals and spouse get a day of rest. Loving God expresses itself not only in how we speak of God and how we spend time with God in Sabbath, it expresses how we treat others over whom we have some power. This command this kind of provides a bridge between this first tablet, which is about our relationship with God, and the second tablet, which is about um, other people, and Jesus summarizes it up as loving our neighbor as ourself. So even as this command, this last command about taking a Sabbath, connects loving God to loving others. Let me share with you a true story that I found in Faith and Leadership magazine, which is related to Duke Divinity School, which does kind of the same thing. It shows the power of spiritual awakening, in which one turns from other gods to serving the God of Christ. In the 1980s and 90s, Alan Graham made his fortune as a real estate developer and entrepreneur. He admired and emulated other well-known and um, wealthy real estate developers. So you can guess one of his folks he looked up to was Donald Trump, and another one was Dallas developer Trammell Crow. He also could be somewhat ostentatious, such as when he signed checks with a $2,000 pen. But there were other parts to him as well. He was a child of divorce. He was determined, therefore, to keep his family together. And so he began accompanying his wife and four children to Mass every Sunday. And, um, ooh, I guess I got down here. To Mass at the Catholic Church and learning about the Catholic faith. In 1996, at a Catholic men's retreat, he confronted his spiritual brokenness and turned to God, asking God, what do you want me to do? 
The answer came in the form of a vision of a catering truck that would deliver sandwiches to the homeless living on the streets of Austin. Now, needless to say, Graham needed to learn some things about homelessness. And so he drew together parishioners in his congregation and started developing a business plan. But it was a formerly homeless janitor that helped him to realize that the needs, what the needs of homeless people are, and that ministry to them needs to be relational, not just a transaction of giving them things. In order to meet as many homeless people as he could, Graham spent about 200 nights sleeping on the streets, listening to their tales of suffering and abuse. His role model shifted from Trump and Crow to Mother Teresa and Francis of Assisi. In his mobile loaves and fishes ministry grew and grew. In 2004, Graham decided more needed to be done and homeless people needed to be lifted off the streets by being given a permanent home within a supportive community. Soon they were housing people in RVs throughout Austin. But, when, but then Graham had another kind of new envisioning and that was of establishing a village of microhomes and RVs for those who were chronically homeless and living on the streets and providing supportive services within it. By leveraging his contacts as a businessman, his gifts as an entrepreneur and his own wealth, his vision came to reality. And in 2015, Community First Village was established. Today, about 170 people live there in that village, including 150 who were formerly homeless and living on the streets, along with missional residents, ranging from retired people to families with children who feel called to live there and to serve. It was a spiritual awakening that began this journey for Graham, a journey that took him from serving the gods of himself and the pursuit of wealth and comfort and then enjoying the benefits in ostentatious living to giving up his career and turning to serve God through serving those who are most in need. He and his wife Tricia now live in this village in a 399 square foot cottage. Graham has says that he finds it to be a phenomenal community. In his words, he says the neighbors are fun they're incredible, and occasionally there are knuckleheads to add a little flavor. Now, most of us are not wealthy, well-connected business entrepreneurs who can develop such a significant ministry. But turning from other gods to serve God of Christ should make a difference in our lives. And I'm not suggesting either that this kind of a ministry is in any way more um, beneficial or better than the kind of homeless ministry we actually do engage in, which is intensely caring for a small number of people, families, and helping them integrate into the community in jobs and in housing. It was a different population here, chronically homeless folks that he worked with. But it demonstrates that turning from the God of serving self to serving the God of Christ can make a very big difference in our lives. So I think this story and this text leaves us questions to ponder. What God do we really serve? And what would it mean to have no other God beside the Lord God? How do we express our wholehearted love and loyalty to God in how we speak and how we spend our time in how we treat others. How might a faithful practice of Sabbath impact our lives and relationships with God and with others? How can we nurture that spiritual life with God so that our priorities are straight and our life vision becomes clear about how we are to live this life of love 
to which Christ has called us. What does it mean to be fully loyal to the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord?